gentlemen, please welcome back Vic Gundotra. Wow. Good morning, everybody. This place is packed. I'm surprised so many of you made it back after that great party last night. You know, let me begin by just thanking you guys for your support. Yesterday was an epic day for Google I.O. Um, it was uh, quite an amazing day, and, and just thank you for being part of that. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And I hope you're enjoying your Android development kits. Yes? All right. You know, that party last night, thank you for many of you who downloaded the new version of Google Plus for Android and then accepted my invitation. We had over 2,600 of you do that. Uh, and of those 2,600 people, over 1,000 people turned on party mode and contributed over 13,700 photographs from last night's concert. Uh, when was the last time you went to uh, an event and the next day had that many photos automatically organized and, chron and chronological? Um, I have to apologize. This is not glass that's distracting me. Um, ever since yesterday, I've developed just this nervous tick. And <laughs> I'm just always wondering, where is Sergey? <laughs> I'm not sure if he's in the building, if he's above the building. Um, as you probably know, he's going to do some fun stuff again today. I hope you've been following his Google Plus posts, um, but I think you're likely to see um, some pretty exciting stuff. With that, let's get started with day two keynote. Uh, and I think you're going to be really excited about what you're going to see here. Um, that's going to be handled by our senior vice president of Chrome and Apps and my friend, Sundar Pichai. Sundar. <laughs> Welcome to day two of Google I.O. Keynote. Uh, it's very exciting to be here. Uh, none of what I have planned involves jumping from an airplane, doing parkour on top of Moscone, or riding a bike onto the stage. Uh, but we nevertheless have lots of exciting stuff ahead. In fact, we've had a few exciting months. But a few months ago, we launched Chrome for Android, which hopefully all of you can use on your brand new Nexus 7. About 10 weeks ago, we launched Google Drive. And just about three weeks ago, we launched a whole new next generation line of Samsung Chromebooks. And we are just getting started. So what we thought we'd do today was to take a step back, talk to you about the journey. Uh, in fact, since the advent of broadband, it's grown a lot, and it's reached today over 2.3 billion users, a staggering number. But the good news is this is only one-third of the world's population. And the way we are going to get to the rest of the world is through mobile. And that's what the second line shows. With the advent of smartphones and better connectivity, increasingly people are accessing the web for the first time ever on their phones. And with the help of mobile, we are going to reach the entire world's population. In fact, it's expected in about four years, there are going to be around 20 billion network connections, about 2.5 network connections for every user in the world. We are in the middle of a revolution. At Google, we saw this trend coming, which is why we built Chrome. About three and a half years ago, we launched Chrome as a, as a browser to help showcase the modern web. And we are very excited and humbled to see that option, thanks to a lot of users and developers like you. About two years ago at Google I.O., we announced to 310 million active users.
What matters, though, is that how people use Chrome. They live on it every day. Every single day, there are over 60 billion words typed in Chrome. That is the equivalent of 100,000 textbooks, or one terabyte of data. Documents, text, images, videos are downloaded every single day. And finally, something which is near and dear to my heart, Chrome is all about speed. Just one feature in Chrome, the fact that when you're typing in the Omnibox, we try to guess where you go, we prefetch and pre-render the page. That feature alone saves 13 years of human lifetime every single day in Chrome. <laughs> and we have hundreds of such features in the product. There's a lot, we are very humbled by this momentum. There's a lot of conversation about share, et cetera. By our internal metrics and everything we see out there, Chrome is the most popular browser in the world globally. <laughs> the landscape has changed pretty significantly since we launched Chrome. At the time we launched Chrome, most of you were using the browser on a single computer. It was primarily the desktop web. Fast forward to today, almost all of you have smartphones. You have a computer at home, at work, you share your devices with family and friends, and increasingly you're buying tablets. So Chrome was built for a better web, but for today's web, we want to make sure Chrome acts as a layer so that your web is personalized, works consistent, and seamlessly across all your devices. To show you how we are doing that, let me invite Brian Rakowski, our Vice President of Product Management, but more fondly known internally as the inventor of incognito mode. Brian. Thanks, Sundar. If you guys are anything like me, you probably use Chrome across a lot of different computers. In fact, you probably just use a lot of different computers. Computers, devices, phones, tablets, all sorts of different things. I counted, I use about eight different computers on a regular basis, and I'm sure a lot of you use many more than that. So to show you how Chrome makes that experience painless, moving across all these different devices to get stuff done, living life in the cloud, I'm going to show you what I do on just a typical day with Chrome. So here I am at home on my MacBook. Over breakfast, I'm reading news, catching up on current events. You see I've got a whole bunch of tabs open here. Some of them I've read. Some of them I haven't read yet. You can see I've got my bookmarks here. Chrome has been customized over the last free, several years of using Chrome uh, to have all of my settings, everything that makes Chrome work well for me. But I'm running out of time, I gotta get to work, so I run out the door, leave my MacBook, and head to work. Now I'm at work. Not too bad of a commute today. Here I am on my Chromebook, and it turns out I use a different computer at work than I do at home. In fact, I use a lot of different computers at work. As a member of the Chrome team, we're always testing new hardware. We're always trying out new devices, uh, reinstalling Chrome, Chrome OS on different things, so I end up using lots of different computers every day to get stuff done. Now it turns out, on this computer, I've never actually signed in. I don't have an account on this computer. So because I've never used it before, I'll just sign in with my username and password. If I got that right, all my settings will start coming down from the cloud. So these are all the settings I showed you on my MacBook. And in addition, I've customized Chrome to start up with some work tabs when I'm at work. So when I hit OK, you should see my work tabs just appear on the screen. And there they are. So you can see I've got my bookmarks here. All my settings are down here. Also these tabs, I can get some work done. You can see the tree is open. That's good. PRD I've been working on for incognito. I can file some bugs. But all this work is kind of making me hungry. It's time for lunch. Let's, let's think about what to have. Um, I feel like something salty, maybe a little bit more of a hearty meal. Uh, some pork, maybe? I heard about this place, but I can't remember the name. Something to do with, with uh, pig. Let me try this query. Let's see what happens. Salty pig parts. Boccalone. OK. That sounds like it might be the place. Let me click. Yes. That's what, that's what I'm looking for. OK, and it looks like there's a location in the Ferry Building. So let me click that. OK, not too far. I can just walk there. 
So leave work, head out the door, and as I walked to the ferry building, I realized that I was so distracted by those pictures of delicious, delicious pork products that I forgot exactly where the location of the place was. In fact, I wasn't paying attention to it at all. But it's not a problem because I've got Chrome installed on my phone, and I'm signed in here too. So I'll just, let me zoom in a little bit. I'll just launch Chrome, open a new tab, and you can see all my recent devices. You can see the Chromebook I had open at work, and that tab is still open there. I can pull it over here. So I'll click the ferry building, and that page should load right here so I can see exactly where I need to go. Now, turns out we didn't just sync that URL. We also made sure that the back button works across pages. So after I've gotten in line, I can start to look at the menu by tapping back, and I can even go back to search results. So back works across devices as well. So now that I'm happily eating my lunch, turns out I'm a little bit of a nerd. I carry a second device around with me when I want a bigger screen. I've got my brand new Nexus 7. And of course, Chrome's installed there too. I've already signed in and started to set it up. Just zoom out. And since I'm having this delicious sandwich, let's say I want to visit a site. It's a blog I haven't been to in a while. I think it's called a hamburger, something about hamburgers. It shows, showcases the best hamburgers every single day that they can find. So I'll just start typing. And because Chrome is synced, even though I've never typed this URL on this device before, typed it on one of my other computers, it's synced here, it saves me a lot of typing. And even better, as Sundar mentioned, we're pretty obsessed with speed. We've started to load this page in the background because we know we're very likely, you're very likely to go there. So when, as soon as I tap this, it should be there waiting. Ready? One, two, three. And the page is already loaded. So I, I can load a page there, enjoy my lunch. Everything will be delicious. So I've shown you Chrome syncing across uh, a couple different laptops, including a Chromebook, uh, a phone, a tablet, all my settings, including my open tabs, my bookmarks, all the things that make Chrome work for me, synchronizing silently in the background, making it painless to live across all these different devices. But there's one more thing I wanted to talk to you about. Some of you have been very persistently asking for one thing in particular. And before we agreed to do it, we wanted to make sure that we did an excellent job of it. I'm very happy to say that the team has really pulled something great out. So you're probably wondering what it is I'm talking about. People have been asking, you've been asking, to use Chrome on your iPhone. So I'm happy to announce that later today, Chrome will be rolling out in the App Store. But I'll give you a sneak preview now. Here's Chrome on my home screen. Launch it, and it should look very familiar to any of you who've used Chrome on another device before. If you use Chrome on Android or a Chromebook, you'll see it's got an Omnibox up top. It behaves just like you'd expect it to. You can open tabs, in as many tabs as you'd like. You can flick through them easily, quickly, it's a silky smooth experience, really fun. You can select the one you're looking for. You can even close tabs with a, with a quick swipe. And if, <laughs> and you can even swap tabs without having to go to the switcher just by dragging from the side. It makes browsing the web on your iPhone really fun. But while we were at it, we figured, why stop there? We might as well go for the iPad, too. So I'll give you a sneak preview of that as well. Here's Chrome on the home screen of my iPad. Launch it. And you can see we've put the tabs up top here, just like we did on the Nexus 7. We've got a little bit more space to work with. It makes multitasking easier. We've got a bunch of tabs open here. And you can see they've started to pile up, because I've got a few too many open. It's not unusual but I can just push them out of the way to get to the one I'm looking for. It's a really nice overflow solution when you've got a lot of tabs open. It's synced. 
Everything is here. So you can see I've got my bookmarks from my desktop. You can find anything I'm looking for. And all my other devices are here. So you can see everything I've done today. You can see I've got all those restaurant pages open on my iPhone. You can see my Nexus 7 where I was looking at food over my lunch. You can see the salty pig parts query which I backed up from uh, on the Boccalone site. The work I did today, looks like I didn't get much work done at all. And you can see all those pages I had open on my MacBook Pro this morning over breakfast. And in case I want to pick up where I left off with one of those pages, I'll just tap it, finish reading the news, and it will load here. Everything just works across devices. But in this case, oh, it looks like I need to log in. Well, it's not a problem. My credentials are synced across machines. Even though I've never used the New York Times on this device before, I've never logged in, I can just tap log in. Because I'm signed in, my credentials are synced, auto-filled. I can log in directly. Now, one more feature before I quit. Incognito, a feature near and dear to my heart. The team did a great job with Incognito here. You can see it works just how you'd expect it to from other computers. You can toggle between regular and incognito windows just by tapping there. And I hope you'll find that using Incognito on a touch device is a great experience. Thank you. Sundar, back to you. Thank you, Brian. It's an exciting demo to see Chrome on Android phones, Android tablets, and now on the iPhone and the iPad. So no matter which device you're using, we are working really hard across all important software platforms. No other browser vendor is doing this. We want to make sure it's about the user, your web, working everywhere, personalized, consistent, always, anytime, anywhere. Of course, when you're living online and living in the cloud, you're using cloud applications. And at Google, we realized this. And in 2004, there was a profound shift on the web. The web shifted from documents to be about rich, interactive web applications. And in 2004, we launched one of the seminal uh, Ajax applications of that era, Gmail. And since then, Gmail has grown to reach 425 million active users, monthly unique users, and it's become a primary communications platform for all these users. We haven't stopped there. We've been very hard at work, and we've continually added more applications. Google Calendar, Google Documents, Google Spreadsheets, Google Presentations, and about 10 weeks ago, we launched Google Drive, a centralized place for you to create and collaborate online and have all your important data with you so that you can live in the cloud. We call this Going Google, and hundreds of millions of users have gone Google. But it's not just at home. There is a very powerful trend underway. We call this consumerization of businesses. It's the same person who leaves home and shows up at work, and they demand the same experience. E smartphones are a good example. People have demanded the same smartphones at work like they've used at home. The same is true for their applications as well. This trend has been so powerful, we are seeing many, many businesses are going Google. In fact, governmental agencies in 45 out of the 50 states in the US, including places like Department of Interior, have gone Google. 66 of top 100 universities in the United States have gone Google. And over 5 million businesses, the rate at which we are signing up businesses is growing steadily, have gone Google. This is a pretty fundamental shift. If you look at most businesses, they're based on the PC architecture. And the PC, which was a huge revolution, was primarily focused on automating your individual workspace. Fast forward to today, most companies have, are, you know, care about collaboration deeply. And you're just not going to get there by using SharePoint or TPS reports. What you need is a radical different architecture to get there which is why many, many large companies are going Google. You can see many big names up there. Let me give you one example. Roche, which has 90,000 employees, over 140 countries. Uh, they acquired Genentech, which was a Google Apps customer, and Roche has decided to deploy Google across their entire employee base. 
So it's a very, very powerful trend. We call this trend going Google, and we put together a few short videos to show you what it is like to go Google. Let's take a look. So yeah, I think we're good. I think that about wraps it up, so. Great, I'll send a follow-up email. I don't, there's nothing much to follow up on, so I. Well, we, we should regroup. We just regrouped. This is the regrouping. <laughs> cool, I'll ping you later. You're pinging me now, what do you want to ping about? Next steps? There are no next steps, we just, we just solved it. Huh, all right. She's a scary lady. She's an angry tiger. She's a man gobbler eater. She's a man eater. Oh, here she comes. Watch out, boy. So as I said earlier, this is a fundamental and a radically different way to collaborate. I'm just trying, try doing that with SharePoint. So about 10 weeks ago, we launched Google Drive. One more step in this journey. In just over 10 weeks, uh, we, over 10 million users have signed into Google Drive. They are creating and collaborating both with Google applications and third-party applications and storing all their important data. And this is another step in our journey to help users go Google. To talk about our journey with Drive, I'd like to invite Clay Bawar, Director of Product Management for Google Apps. Thank you, Sundar. As Sundar said, Google Drive is all about making it really easy to live life in the cloud. And that starts by making all of your files available on all of your devices anywhere. And to do that, we've built a really nice web interface, desktop sync applications for Windows and for Mac, and also a really, really nice Android app. But like with Chrome, we want Drive to be available on every platform. And so today, I'm really excited to announce we're making it available on iOS and on Chrome OS. So let me start here on, uh, on iOS, here on the iPad. I'm just going to zoom out a bit. And I'll just open up Drive. And you can see the interface is really, really fluid. It works just like you'd expect. You can browse through dozens and dozens of file types here. I'll pull up a, a photo. It's a bigger photo than I remember. And um, everything just works like you'd expect. But it's not just browsing that we've made available on the iOS experience. We brought a lot of the best features of Drive right to the mobile and tablet experience. So for example, um, I'm going to open up this folder of receipts here. I'm a big nerd. I scan all of my receipts. Um, but I was also too lazy to actually title any of these. But I know that somewhere in here, there's a receipt from the post office with a tracking number. So what I can do here is just search. And I'm going to type uh, certified mail. I think that word was in there somewhere. And just like that, I can pull up the receipt. <laughs> now, notice this isn't a text file. There's no text in here. I haven't written anything. Instead, we used optical character recognition technology to actually extract the text from the scan, index it, and then make it searchable. Now, the cool thing is that doesn't just work with text. That's yeah, pretty cool. It doesn't just work with text. It works with photos, too. Let me show you what I mean. So here I have a big pile of photos. I took a trip with my wife through Africa last year. And I know somewhere in here are photos of us at the pyramids. But again, I didn't title my, my, my photos. I didn't add keywords. 
But if I search for pyramids, just do a search, up come the images of us at the pyramids. Right. So again, we can actually use image recognition technology to peer inside of the images to actually understand the content. I don't have to do anything. No labels, no metadata, no nothing. It just works. So, of course, I don't always have an internet connection. And so Drive makes it really easy to just save things, cache them offline. So here, I'll just save this manual offline so I can read it whenever. Um, and of course, at its core, Drive is about enabling sharing and collaboration. So I can add users to collaborate in documents with me right from the app. So here's, I think, a, a relevant document here. I haven't gotten very far, um, but I'm going to add Brian right here. He's now backstage. And uh, we'll see if he has any other ideas. Give him edit access. And I've added him right there. So we'll come back to that in a second. So that's Google Drive on iOS. It's available for iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch later today. Check it out. We think you'll like it. So if we could go over to the Chromebook now. I want to show you Drive on Chrome OS. So with Drive on Chrome OS, what we did was actually integrate it deep into the operating system. So what I can do here is I'm just going to open up my application tray, open up files, and basically Google Drive is just the file system. It's your hard drive in the cloud, and we sync down everything silently so that you have all of your stuff whenever you need it, everywhere, right there. So, of course, Drive does a lot more than just sync your files to the cloud. It enables some amazing applications. And one of those is real-time collaboration in the cloud um, with applications like Google Docs. So I'm going to open up this document here. Oops. There we go. And I'm also going to pull it up on my smartphone and on my tablet. Here is on my smartphone. ideas are these here? Show some lolcats. <laughs> and here's everything synced across all of my devices. Right, keystroke by keystroke, I can see these edits. Everything just works. Now, this last point is an important one. Um, Google Docs works great if you're connected to the internet. But what if you're on a plane or you don't have a connection? What about then? We've been thinking about that. And we're really excited to announce that today, Google Documents works for editing offline. So let me show you how this works. So what I'm going to do is uh, we've turned off wireless on the laptop here. And I'm just going to unplug the Ethernet cable. So there it is. It's unplugged. And uh, just to prove to you that I am, in fact, offline, New York Times, no connection. But I can just go back to my Google Doc, and I can keep editing, just like I'm online. All the formatting still works. And you'll see that Google Docs, it's just noticed gracefully I'm offline. All of my, sa all my changes are just saved locally to a local cache, and I can keep on without even thinking about it. It all just works without me even noticing. So what I'm going to do now is I've made some changes offline. Maybe my, Brian and folks backstage are making some more changes. Um, I'm going to close this document. All my changes are saved. I'm going to plug Ethernet back in. And now watch what happens when I open the document, because it's going to happen pretty quickly. I'm going to open it back up in Drive. And like that, it's going to be synced back to the cloud. And you'll see it across all of my devices updated in real time. So let me open up the Drive web interface. Here it is. And I'm going to open up this document and get ready, because it happens quick. There is, and there it is. Everything, everything just syncs. And once you've shown the feature, move on to the next thing. So that's Google Documents working offline. Um, it's available today. We're working on offline presentations and spreadsheets. Those are coming soon. But if you're flying back um, from Google I.O. and you don't have internet on the plane, try out Google Docs. It works great. 
Um, we think you really love it. So, Google Docs offline. <laughs> now, um, if we could just go to the, the Chromebook, um, Google Documents is just one application that Google Drive makes possible. But users can also create and edit and share all sorts of stuff with dozens and dozens of third-party applications that have integrated with Google Drive using the Google Drive SDK. We've actually just updated our SDK to version 2 today. Um, and let me show you what's possible with this SDK. So as a user, what I can do is go to the Chrome Web Store, add additional apps that integrate with Drive, and they just show up here in the More menu. So I can fax. Um, I can send and receive faxes with HelloFax right from Google Drive. So you can get rid of your fax machine and just have fax, faxes come straight to Drive. I can create and edit images and videos and charts. And now the neat thing about the way the integrations work is files you create with these third-party applications, they're stored, just al they're stored alongside everything else, just like regular files. So I've created a uh, couple of diagrams for Google I.O., and I just click that. And notice I don't have to log in or authenticate. It just launches the file. It opens the application. It takes a couple seconds. And then we're in LucidChart, one of my favorite applications. You know, this is a really deep statement here. Um, so one of the neat things about Drive is our developers, not only do they get access to millions and millions of users, authentication, sharing, Google Drive storage, but they're telling us that their users that come from Drive are actually more active than users that come to their applications directly. So LucidChart tells us that their users, when they come from Drive, because of the sharing and ease of creation, create three times more diagrams. HelloFax users send 25% more faxes. Slide Rocket users are three and a half times as likely to create a presentation. So developers are seeing really, really great distribution using Drive. We actually have a session um, right after this at 11.45 in room 8 on the Drive SDK. I actually this morning just whipped up a uh, little diagram to help get you there uh, in case you're interested. Um, room 8, 11.45. So um, that's the Google Drive SDK. Version 2 is coming out today. We're really excited about it. You also saw Google Drive for iOS and for Chrome OS and Documents now working offline. So we're really excited about where we're taking Google Drive. We hope you'll join us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Clay. So just like Chrome, Google Cloud applications, Google Drive now also works on Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, Chrome OS, across all your platforms and all your devices so that you can live online in the cloud seamlessly. So we are very excited by that. About a few years ago, we set out on this journey to really help users live in the cloud to design an end-to-end -end computing experience. And that's what the Chrome OS journey is all about. A year ago, at Google I.O., we launched our first generation Chromebooks. Our goal was to get the product out there, help seed the market, get feedback from developers like you. Since then, we've been hard at work. We release a version of the operating system every six weeks and automatically update it to all Chromebooks out there. There are no versions, no downloads, no installs. We constantly update them. We brought it all together about three weeks ago for the next generation Chromebooks, there are three main, main aspects to it. First of all, they're significantly faster. They are about 3x faster than the first generation Chromebooks, thanks to faster processors, and the entire software stack is now hardware X-rated. So it's really fast and smooth, as fast as you know, computers which are around $1,000. It has a full end-to-end -end new user experience. You saw a bit of that earlier. Uh, it, is, it treats applications as first-class citizens. So you're no longer tied to a browser window you can have full screen experiences. You can have applications side by side, multiple windows. You can pin them to the taskbar, et cetera. And we are really investing in the application ecosystem. You saw examples with Google Drive working on it, and important applications like Google Documents now working offline. One of the things which excites about it is we call it the always new computer. Since we updated it automatically, even people who bought the first generation Chromebook, a lot of them wrote to us three weeks ago and said they opened their computer, it got faster and they have a whole new window manager at work, just like that. So we are very excited by the model we are working on, and we are going to be investing a lot more here. One of the feedback, the last version was well received, but more people wanted to get their hands on and see what these are like. So as of today, we are going to make Chromebooks available in physical retail, 100 Best Buy stores, 
all across the United States <laughs> so that users can try them and, and buy them. We are doing the same in uh, UK with Dixons as well. As we go through the next few months, you're going to see a lot more. Uh, we are working with many more OEMs and Intel to get a whole lineup ready for the holiday season. So stay tuned. One of the things when I came to Google in 2004, I was inspired by taking a tour of our data center, just walking inside them and seeing hundreds and hundreds of computers powering applications like Google Search, and we had just launched Gmail, and seeing the scale of the infrastructure needed was inspiring. But it is very hard for web developers externally to get access to that kind of infrastructure. We want you to write great web applications, and so we've been thinking hard about how to provide you with the same quality of infrastructure we enjoy at Google. To do that, I want to invite Urs Hotzley, our first VP of engineering, one of the first 10 employees at Google, and the person more than anyone responsible for building all of Google's infrastructure, Urs. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. Uh, we've heard a great thing, a uh, great many things today about applications, clients, uh, uh, and, but I'm here today to talk about servers and the infrastructure that powers all these applications. Um, a long time ago, at Google, we started working very hard to build the world's fastest, most scalable, and most reliable infrastructure. We needed our infrastructure to deliver incredible scale and incredible performance at a very low cost. And over the years, we built one of the world's largest set of data centers and one of the world's largest networks to connect these data centers. And then we started looking at ways to deliver that infrastructure to you so that you can build great applications for your users. And so in 2008, we launched App Engine. App Engine lets you write simple, intuitive code to build your apps, and then we take them, and we manage them, and we scale them for you. So if you have one request per second or 1,000 requests per second, it just works. We're thrilled about the popularity of App Engine. Today, it's so supporting over a million active applications, 7.5 billion uh, hits per day, every day, and 2 trillion data store operations per month. That easily makes it the largest public NoSQL data store infrastructure in the world. Thank you. So more and more developers are using App Engine, and every day we hear success stories from them. Here's one from Japan, where earlier this month, a fully one-third of Japan was watching a national song contest. And App Engine was powering uh, the live streaming and the voting for this event. At its peak, it ran at 24,000 requests per second. Yet no other App Engine user noticed that this was going on. So the ability to sail through this kind of traffic spike allows you to focus on your application while we focus on handling the traffic. So we're very proud of what App Engine has enabled uh, all of you developers uh, to do. But many of you have said you want even more options. And specifically, you've told us that you want virtual machines on demand with industry-leading performance, with industry-leading scalability, and so easy and cheap to run that you'd prefer them to your in-house servers. Well, today, I'm going to show you what it is like to run in Google's cloud. I'm here to announce Google Compute Engine, infrastructure as a service that delivers the kind of performance <laughs> and scale and value Oh, you haven't, you haven't seen anything yet. Thanks. Uh, uh, but the, the infrastructure as a service that delivers a performance and scale and value that only Google can deliver. So Compute Engine gives you Linux virtual machines at Google scale. Spin up two VMs or 10,000 VMs. It just works. You have multiple storage options. You have high performance networking between VMs. 
so that you can form them into a cluster, and you have great connectivity to your end users using Google's global backbone. So let me show what Compute Engine and App Engine together can do. One of our beta testers was the Institute for Systems Biology. The ISB uh, uses genomic analysis to decipher how genes function and to find relationships between the genes that signal the potential for new cancer drugs. They wrote an App Engine app that connected to Compute Engine virtual machines. Uh, and you'll see uh, it here on the screen. Here. Uh, they they uh, show the human genome in a circular form. And the application allows researchers to visually explore the associations between genes, mutations, and other factors. And each of these associations is shown with a blue line like that. Now, this may look simple, but this kind of analysis requires a tremendous amount of computation. So ISB built an in-house cluster with 1,000 nodes uh, to handle this kind of computation. Yet it still took them 10 minutes to compute just a single association using the entire cluster. So fortunately, it took only a few days to port this application to Compute Engine. And let's see how Compute Engine performs on this application. Now remember, on their in-house 1,000-core cluster, what you would see here is one line appear, you know, click, and then you'd wait for 10 minutes to see the next line. So let's see what Compute Engine can do with this. All right, so this is what happens when you add 10,000 uh, cores to your application. Instead of it taking 10 minutes, you get a new association every few seconds. That's the kind of scalability and performance that Google can deliver. And so today, anyone with large-scale computing needs can now access this same infrastructure with Compute Engine virtual machines. And this infrastructure comes with a scale and a performance and a value that is unparalleled in the industry because you benefit from the efficiency of Google data centers and our decade of experience in running them. What you get from Google is not just the scale, but also amazing stable performance. So our virtual machines and storage are predictably fast, so you can rely on a consistent level of performance no matter who else is running on Compute Engine right now. Just as App Engine was able to handle a huge spike uh, in the Japanese application. For example, when Invite Media ported their ad server from another cloud provider to Compute Engine, they were able to double the number of connections that each single VM can accept at using VMs of comparable size. And more importantly, they were able to reduce the number of connection errors by over a factor of 10 because of the predictable performance. You can hear more directly from Compute Engine uh, beta users in the technical sessions about Compute, en Compute Engine, which you will see uh, show up on your I.O. calendar after this talk. So be sure to check them out. Now, finally, we know that you want top scalability and top performance, but you also need value. And Compute Engine is a great value, delivering up to 50% more compute per dollar than other cloud providers. So you don't have to choose between getting the best performance and getting the best price. We worked very hard for a decade to lower the cost of computing, and we're passing these savings on to you. Compute Engine is now open uh, in limited preview, and it's amazing to finally be able to talk about this. It's amazing to see 10,000 cores working for a single application and what that can do. So 10,000 cores, I think that's really cool. But you know what's really cool? Well, we know that some of you need even more scale, and we have the technology to help you. For computations, that are very, very computationally intensive, 
but don't need that much I.O. We can scale much, much higher. You may have noticed this ticker uh, counting up since the start of my presentation. Well, this ticker is not a conceptual counter. It shows the actual count of the number of cores available to the genome app right now. And they've all been added since the beginning of this presentation. So what would you say to 770,000 cores available to your app? So, so if you're ISB, you would say, actually, my app kind of taps out at 600,000 cores. It doesn't scale any further. So let's leave 170,000 idle and allocate 600,000 to the genome app, and let's see how fast it runs. Let's switch to the app. Right, there's a little initial delay. And then we really get going. So this is the same computation now running on 600,000 cores. That is cool. Right? And, that, and that is how infrastructure as a service is supposed to work. So this, ladies and gentlemen, truly is the best time ever to deliver and to build for the web. You now have access to the scale and performance of Google's infrastructure at a great price. And it's up to you to figure out how to make the best use of that. So with that, uh, back to Sundar. Thank you. Woohoo! I was jumping up back there when I saw the 600,000 cores, the kind of scale which you could only dream about. So it's incredibly exciting that you all now have access to what we have had internally at Google. I can't wait to see what you all build next. Of course, infrastructure is only one component of writing great web applications. The other thing is the actual underlying platform. And we've been working hard with a lot of you and other browser vendors and the open web community to advance that forward. What you're seeing behind me, let's switch to the visualization, please. What you're seeing behind me is the visualization of how the web platform has evolved over the years. It's inspiring and humbling to see names like Mosaic, Netscape, the introduction of HTML, CSS. But what's interesting is as you go to the far right, you can see it gets denser. It's, it's much richer. That's because the web platform is evolving at a faster pace than ever before, which makes sense because the web is increasingly being used across many, many new types of devices, phones, tablets, and so on. And we need to make sure we evolve the web to support those use cases. The good news is it's happening very fast. One of the great things about the web is as we add APIs, developers like you immediately take advantage of it to write great web applications. So let me give one example. About a year and a half ago, from the Chrome team, we decided to support games, rich games, online. Why? Games tend to push the limits of a platform. They're really hard on the platform, and if you can run games, you can pretty much do anything else. So we talked to game developers, and we found out what APIs they need. A lot of it was what we were already working on, and we started adding them to Chrome. So let's take a look at what's happening. So let's switch to a game. Can is going to help me with it. What we are showing you, uh, can we switch to the game, please? What we are showing you is a game called Gaikai, which is being streamed. Uh, it's a service called Gaikai. This is being streamed live online, and they can do it to any internet-connected devices. There is no download. There is no install. You just click and play different games. This particular game is called Bulletstorm, and I've been assured all you do is shoot aliens in this process. So let's take a look. Uh, so Can is going to load up the game and play, and what you will notice is that, first of all, it's a rich full-screen experience. It's very immersive. We do it through the full-screen API. The sound effects are all enhanced audio APIs we have added in the last year. To do a game like this, you need real good performance. You need raw network access. We do it through UDP. The local performance on the client you see there 
is being done because we are executing in a native client sandbox. And finally, to do something like this, obviously, Can is using a gamepad, and we need, needed to give access to a peripheral like the gamepad with the gamepad API. So doing that, you can see a very, very rich game. By the way, it's running in a Chrome box, so you can spin it around because everything is hardware accelerated. So, <laughs> so it's not just Gaikai and Bulletstorm which, which have done this. We have seen several, let's switch to the slides. We have seen several mainstream games, Angry Birds, Cut the Rope, all available in the Chrome Web Store. In fact, even AAA console-style games like Bastion, From Dust, are all available in the Web Store now to play. Angry Birds alone has been played by more than 140 million users. And what's happening in games is happening in every other vertical in the Web Store. Games, entertainment like music, educational apps, and apps for businesses as well. Over 750 million applications have been installed, and people are enjoying living online in the cloud every day. And we are just getting started. We are going to evolve Chrome apps pretty significantly. There are three major areas we are going to focus on. First is we need to make sure all applications are always available. You saw the example with Docs offline. So as you write a Chrome application, we are going to provide developers with a way to package resources automatically by default, including the UI, so that you can always serve the application locally. The second thing is we want to make sure you get an authentic app experience, just like what you saw with the game earlier. So we want to break out of the browser window when you want to, give full screen experiences, as well as provide new UI containers for applications. And finally, when you write a Chrome application, we want to make sure you have access to every underlying device API across phones, tablets, and desktops. So we are working hard at that. If you download the Chrome Canary Bill, you can see what we are doing there. And we have sessions later in the day where you can get a lot more, lot more details. It is one thing to write great web applications, but it is an entirely different thing to take a real-world experience, something with amazing artistry, like what Cirque du Soleil creates, and translate that to the cloud, something very hard to do. And to share that journey, let me invite Joanne and Aubrey from Cirque du Soleil. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. For those of you who know Cirque du Soleil, and I hope many of you do, you will understand that we always strive to create immersive and fantastical experiences for our patrons, experiences that will make them dream for a little while. We also constantly ask ourselves, how do we evolve beyond the live world? How do we create experiences that reach more people? How do we create worlds that people participate in? The web is an obvious option because it can reach anyone on the planet. However, we know how difficult it is to transport anyone into an imaginary world if they can't actually experience it firsthand. In this project, we were still facing the same big question. Could the web deliver the experience we envision? Could the technology give the possibility to the user to actually interact with the environment and lose themselves in it? To create this new world, we knew we needed to go beyond text, pictures, and videos. We all really wanted to evoke people's emotion, to awaken their imagination, and to enrich their lives. But I have to say, when we saw the preliminary result of this project, we all got so excited. We were surprised. Some of us were actually really touched and stunned, I would say, by the, the depth and the richness of the visual animation. The creative team and this new technology have created an experience that evokes a beautiful, immersive, and sensorial world that truly resembles Cirque du Soleil and that can be enjoyed by everyone when and where they feel it. The combination of great creative minds and this new web technology opened possibilities that we didn't know existed before. I will let Aubrey, our development partner, to show you what we built together, and most importantly, probably for you guys, 
how we built it. Aubrey? Thanks, Joanne. It's awesome. This is awesome to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Cirque du Soleil in a browser. What a fantastic challenge. Let's take a look at our demo and see how we did. Now, in order to get you into the experience in a different way, we allow you to control the navigation and perspective by moving your body. As the experience starts, our tour guide shows us how to do it. We've used the Get User Media API inside WebRTC to enable the user's camera and detect faces and track motion, and then we map that back to the navigation controls in the app. Ken, can you move left and right and show that behavior? There he goes. You'll notice Ken's silhouette at the bottom as he moves. This gives him some feedback about where he is in space. And then once our guide feels like we've got the hang of it, she opens up the curtains, and we're invited into her imaginary world. I love it when something very complex turns out to be created with simple ingredients. We've created this world completely in HTML. We've combined web video and images and markup into virtual set pieces, which we then position in 3D space using CSS. You can see how the elements parallax in response to Ken's movements. That's because the elements are each positioned individually, and it creates this very realistic interactive environment for us to explore. The HTML elements are then brought to life with CSS animations and filters individually. And it's all amazingly fast because of hardware accelerated rendering in the browser. What you're seeing here is all running on a Chromebook. After exploring this world, we just need to follow our guide and take the leap. Now, we wanted to accentuate the 3D nature of this experience with this fall. You might consider using a plugin or WebGL to accomplish something like this. Uh, but what you're seeing here is just divs. Uh, we've used individual CSS animations to spin the elements, uh, and we've used one long 3D transform. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? <laughs> we have one long 3D transform, which uh, transforms the, uh, the whole model. And uh, at the end of the fall, we splash into a vernal pool where we can enjoy a performance. Now, to see how this world is actually put together, let's take a look at the source. I'm feeling brave. Ken, can you open up the Chrome developer tools? He's totally already done it. Uh, because this is just markup in the browser, we can actually manipulate these elements in real time right while the application is running. Uh, here, Ken is able to change the uh, rotation property in the CSS, and the whole model will move in space. Our navigation controls will even still work here, and it just transforms the elements from their new position. Now, another great thing about this approach is that it's wonderfully portable. For example, it works just as well in a web browser on a tablet. Ken, will you bring up the app on a device? Oh, look, there it is. Here, we can take advantage of the unique capabilities in the device, uh, like the accelerometer and gestures. Notice as Ken uh, tilts the device, our perspective is changing in the same way that it changed when he was uh, uh, tracking to the camera. And it just happens for us, because uh, CSS is giving the instructions, and we're letting the hardware-accelerated uh, browser, in whatever runtime we find ourselves in, do all the work. I hope you've enjoyed this short preview you from, uh, about what's coming from Cirque du Soleil. And I hope it highlights the kind of immersive, beautiful user experience you can create using the HTML skills I bet most of you already have and a great browser like Google Chrome. Thanks. I've been very impressed by watching Cirque du Soleil live and to see that come online shows you the power of what you can do on the web today. Uh, it's been a very exciting journey, and a lot of it started with Chrome and we built it together with our users and developers like you. None of what we showed today would have been possible without the journey of Chrome, and so we put together a short video to recap what the journey has been like with you all. So let's take a look. Today I want to be talking to you about HTML5 to interesting aspects of the new standard. 
Chrome has amazing frame rate capabilities. Frame rate, capa frame rate capabilities. So it's been an exciting journey, and we really need your help to do what's next. And so we thought the best way to package all the goodness you saw today and give it to all of you. And there's no better way for us to do that than literally give you all a Chromebox, the brand new Samsung Chromebox, which, which, <laughs> hopefully you have some extra space in your Android developer pack with, in addition to the three devices. So uh, the web is entirely what you all make of, make of it. And we rely on the help of developers like you to succeed in what we do and help users live online. So we hope you continue to develop a lot of great web applications. And we will see you next year. Thank you. Uh, welcome uh, here to a beautiful day in San Francisco. We're on the roof of the Mosque Center. Uh, I know we showed you something really special yesterday, and we got so much interest that we want to show you how we put it all together. And actually, we want to show you some of the pretty same exciting action that you saw, but uh, from a new perspective this time. So you can see this is the roof. Uh, some of our bikers are warming up out there. Uh, and they're doing some, some of their cool tricks, getting ready for their uh, part of this demonstration. Uh, you can also see that the airship is actually overhead. It's pretty close to the sun. I don't know if we can get a camera on that. Uh, you might be able to see it through my view, through my glass in the Hangout. Uh, and uh, we actually have a number of the jumpers in the Hangout now. Now, as I walk over here, you'll see that it's actually tricky to keep them in the Hangout because of the really challenging wireless environment. Um, and uh, if I can show you all on here, uh, we're pointing uh, each of these uh, dishes uh, using different kinds of RF technology for redundancy. Uh, each jumper has a different piece of technology coming down, and that's how we felt uh, comfortable that we could maintain at least uh, a couple of them in the Hangout. Um, I'm also, by the way, testing out a new uh, kind of uh, iteration of glass with these uh, shade clip-ins here right now. And, um, uh, and they're, uh, definitely makes it better out here in the bright sun. Uh, so we're going to have, uh, uh, we've worked uh, you know, with, uh, with a lot of people around here, the city of San Francisco, the FAA, and uh, the, the 
the FISBO offices, Oakland and San Jose, to make this happen. Uh, but the coordination is pretty tricky, as you might imagine. Uh, let's, uh, let's see, we are jump masters here. This is Marshall. Marshall, how far out are we? We're under two minutes from, uh, from the wingsuits being in the air. We're under two minutes? Yes. Uh, okay, that's super exciting. And uh, um, you guys might be able to see their perspectives right now in the Hangout live. Uh, this is pretty exciting to me. How's, uh, have you heard from JT? How are they doing up there? They're, they're uh, getting in a position right now. They're going to hover for a little while. They're going to open the door. They're going to fly their wings in northwest of us right here, deploy their parachutes. And then you and I will be out here, and there will be high fives and smiles when they land. <laughs> All right, awesome. So since we only have a couple minutes, why don't you guys walk with me? I want to get closer to their landing zone. And, uh, you know, as we go here, I can just point out, I mean, it's just stunning here. But if you look over there, uh, as we walk toward the landing zone, you can see a fog bank right over there. And that fog bank is actually very scary to us. Uh, it seems to be clearing out, so we feel good about the jump today. But there was no guarantee. And uh, in fact, I should note that skydiving, uh, you know, there's no such thing as instrument skydiving. You actually have to see your landing. Uh, Though I guess conceivably with glass, you could make an instrument version. You know, you got a nice heads up display where you're going. Uh, but anyway, I, we'll, we'll have to try that another time. I know I'm scaring my jump master. Anyway, today we have sunny skies. Uh, you can see uh, there's the uh, airship pretty much straight overhead. If, I don't know if we can get, well, maybe we'll get another shot of that. We have a few cameras scattered here that can show you that. And um, let's keep walking here. Uh, a lot of exciting action. Now, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to block uh, your view. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the audience is seeing right now. How's our hangout going? We're ready to go up to the airship. OK. They're ready to jump. They're ready to jump. OK, cool. How's our view in the hangout coming along? I think JT is ready. If JT's you ready? Throw it up to JT. OK, that's so cool. All right, well, why don't, we, why don't we throw it up to JT, and he can take it away. and. Hopefully this hangout will go as well as yesterday did, but you know, you never know. A million things can go wrong. Okay, take it away, JT. Yeah. Good to be here, Terry. Got lucky with that fog. Good, good job calling ahead on that one, Sergey. Having it just kind of okay, push I can away. See the cabin from here. Perfect. I mean, it's obviously high up. It's kind of hard to spot from here if the door is open. They'll be slowing down and hovering right before they exit the next exit the aircraft. Okay, okay. I'll give us a 10 second countdown. We'll be able to watch the whole show. Oh, that's so exciting. Thank you so much, Marshall. It was a beautiful day for this. You know, earlier we had the clouds. It was, uh, it was, that was to say the least. definitely touch and go. And, you know, uh, I'm so excited that today, you know, yesterday was really fun, but I was down in the auditorium. And by the way, for, uh, for those of you who are, uh, who are actually watching uh, at I.O., you can see from the lobby. Uh, you might not be able to see quite the skydiver angle, but uh, you'll be able to see some of the other uh, activity that we have. Uh, for those of you who are in downtown San Francisco, this would probably be a good time to peek out your windows. Now, are you, do you know when the door is open? Maybe I'll, uh... Are you guys ready for us? Okay. Yeah, so Hi, they are ready. Uh, no. Do Okay. All right, so we're, we're about to, we're gonna see them actually uh, uh, from the door here. Well, you'll have the, you'll be seeing the first person shot. Uh, of them exiting. For those of you in San Francisco who are looking from the Moscone area, uh, it's the back door on the uh, port side of the ship. All right. Okay, and we should get a countdown momentarily. Yeah, they're hovering. We're going to get a countdown. You can see they're pretty much right over the Intercontinental Hotel. And Marshall, who's going to run the countdown? It's going to be Neil from the airship. Okay, Neil's on the airship. He's going to be counting down. Yeah. Open now? 
Yep, the door is open. Good morning, San Francisco. Hey, how are the winds doing down there? All right, well, we're going for it. Okay, we got 30 seconds, everyone. I'm Killer super excited about this. See you in a the airship's few. almost straight overhead. Uh, it's a beautiful day. We're really lucking out that the fog is holding back. Uh, Door is open. The airship is pretty much standing oh, yeah? still right now. So we're uh, just going that way. God, that must be a beautiful right. feeling to just fly right out of there. Six. Five, One. And there they are. There they are. You can see them flying. They're soaring across the sky toward the, toward the downtown. Look at that. Look at that. And they're weaving close in and out of each other. Uh, with the hangout footage, I'm sorry, and I don't have it. Uh, 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 a monitor here to view it must be beautiful. Their shoots are opening. We got two shoots open. And the third one with a puff of smoke just opened. If you're wondering why, uh, we had to put one of them with a puff of smoke so he, uh, so the radio aiming folks can, you, can know which skydiver was theirs. Why don't we walk over here and uh, get in position? We'll try to get behind five so they land. Yes, yes. Let's, uh, if we can get over this way pretty quick. And hopefully you guys can tag along. Hey, bikers, ready? You can see we're getting ready. Skydivers coming down. All right, where should I stand here? All right, you can see them clearly. You can now. All right. Okay, while we step right over here, they're going to be landing coming towards us. Here comes JT right here. All right. Woo! Yeah, buddy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here comes Terry. Here comes. All right. Whoa, Whoa. I'm coming. Whoa. All right, all right. Nice and Terry. <laughs> so cool. That was awesome. That's where Congratulations. Thanks that was great. Us. Thanks for coming down. <laughs> All right. That was amazing. Job. Nice All job. of our jumpers are down. Um, and they make it look so easy. All right. Don't get blown away here. Hey, that was great. Thanks again. Man, that was amazing cool. jump. Thanks, guys. I had the yeah, best visuals of you, Carrie. That was great. <laughs> yeah, I do. Whoa. Nice great. Hey. That was awesome. Good job. All right, thanks guys so much. Yeah, I was like, oh, now, don't forget, we tested, uh, that was an amazing jump. We have more in store to show you, just uh, how did we do the rest of it. We have our excellent bikers here, and uh, you know, this is a really fun area here. There are a few kind of natural blocks and things, but the, the killer thing that we put in there, because the roof goes up and down, uh, there's a really great ramp that we put in there, and that was where you saw that magical moment. So maybe we can actually get a chance to see the bikers. Uh, let's see what you guys got. All right, why don't you hit the ramp? All right, and we're gonna try to make our way so we can, first of all, watch this, watch this. Yeah, whoa, another backflip. That was amazing. God. All right, we're gonna we're gonna head over now and uh, try to catch them on the other side. The roof goes actually up, and then there's the giant drop off on the other side. Uh, yesterday they cruised right through that, but today we're gonna we're gonna get ourselves time to get over there so we can have a really nice view. So please follow along. Now uh, we're gonna have to go through some of the deep, uh, deep dark cavernous parts of the building. And uh, we're going to try to hustle there and get there pretty quick. Uh, oh. Um, and uh, OK, this time today, because we're not in such a hurry, the bikers are going to wait for us. If you haven't seen the uh, 
inside of Moscone. Uh, it's a pretty exciting sight through there, so let's make our way through. So are we keeping running right now? Okay. But when I straight down all the way through. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you guys can follow here. I'm gonna unclip my shades now so I can see a little bit better. And uh, this is just a portion of all the equipment that powers this building. We actually, when we were talking about this originally, we looked at having people bike and jump up and down through here. Okay, I'm going to, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, 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 these might uh, work a little bit better for me. I'm gonna clip my, uh, these shade clip-ins to this uh, other pair of glasses here and uh, just, uh, it's a little accessory that we're working on, and it's pretty nice on a bright day like this. So here we are, and uh, actually it's kind of cool because uh, I don't know if you guys can see me right now. Uh, I'm now in a hangout. Uh, back on the other side had a little bit of issues keeping me in the hangout, but here uh, it's working nicely. And uh, here we can make our way, we can check this out. Maybe we'll... Um, you guys can follow along with me. We can see the bikers are right up there. It's a really big drop, actually. It's a really big drop. I'm gonna duck under here. And it's a, I mean, I know they make it look easy, but they're probably, what, 15 feet up there? And uh, they're gonna just show us how they get down off that big ramp. All right, guys. Let's see you go. They're hitting the drop. You can see that there, we got three actually. And it's a long way down. It's a long way down. Here, I'm actually gonna take off my glass so you can see this. Okay. Now, uh, hopefully they've made it down safe and sound. Uh, uh, hopefully it's back to them. We're gonna make our way downstairs too and catch up with you. Hey. Thank you all for watching. I know we had a lot of uh, interest, and we just wanted to show for the people who just, you know, heard about it this yesterday. Want to show you about something what it took, and actually show you some of that amazing action again. All right. Well, we'll keep you abreast of our progress on glass. Um, this is just one of the exciting things that we've uh, had the privilege of working on, and uh, and. Uh, I'm hoping this, this is going to lead to something really exciting going forward.
Hi there, I'm Daniel Seberg on day two of IO Live, and we are in the Chrome Showcase, joined right now by NJ from Adobe to talk about a couple of really cool projects that you've been working on, Shadow and Brackets. Tell me about, which one you want to start with, by the way? Start with Brackets. Okay. So Brackets is um, a free and open source uh, code editor for front-end web development. So